a defender on the other team came in from behind. Their feet flew out from underneath her. I've fallen like that plenty of times, and I guess this time was just the last straw. I keep waiting to wake up. This didn't really happen. These are stories of real people. We participate in people's lives when they're the most vulnerable, when they're most frightened. We share those moments with them, and we ease them through that time. He looked great, um, but then he started to get sicker and sicker and, and working harder to breathe. I was looking at his little outfit I have in the bag that he was supposed to wear home and, and just, you know, hoping that he gets to. At 15, I was doing every drug I could get my hands on. I was in complete denial. I had no idea. And they said, you know, if you don't get your daughter help, she's only 17, she's going to die. These are stories of the Sharp experience. I played with some of the greatest blues players in the world. Muddy Waters, Screaming Jay Hawkins, Howlin' Wolf. <laughs> no one ever told me that playing drums would eventually wear things out. I played hard. See, uh, a lot of guys play flat-footed like that, like that. I played way up on the pedals like that. So my feet were like that, man, banging those pedals. like. So now we know what wears these out, don't we? <laughs> This is the golden platinum for the, the work I did with the Doobie Brothers. You just try and learn to live with it, but man, you know. He always had some knee soreness and issues. You just hear him wince when he goes up and down the stairs, kind of like <sighs> Or some little swift turns, he'll just really just yeah. Come on over here uh, and move uh, that way just a little bit. Uh, so you're having a lot of pain today, huh? Well, yeah. My knees give me enough pain to where it gets really bitter. He came home and I watched him get out of the car and stand there for a, at least a minute. And I thought, oh, gosh. The problem with pain is that it's a slow grind and it just beats you down really slow. Are you getting any clicking, catching, buckling? Oh, yeah. Things like that? Yeah, if you, if you, oh, yeah. Has your walking distance decreased? Yeah, sometimes going from the house to the car is an issue. Any discomfort that way? Yeah. OK. Yeah, no, and I'm going to have to push here for the, I'm sorry. I'm so, sorry, I know. That's all right. That's it. That's <sighs> I'm sorry. Oh, it's OK. I'm used to it hurting. You've lost all the cartilage, so that's all bone on bone now. Basically, what we do is go in and just shave off that bad bone. We're going to use macoplasty. It's a resurfacing of the knee versus a total knee replacement. That gives that nice, smooth surface. And the incision is going to be about this big, right about there. OK? Well, we'll take good care of this guy. Can't wait till we're on the other side. Just can't wait. Here we are. In San Diego, Sharp Coronado is the first hospital to utilize macoplasty. Oh, nice outfit. <laughs> Thank you. You look good, too. Let me sign your knee, OK? Make sure you get the right one. All right, man, I'll talk to you later. You'll be just fine. <laughs> I'm going to be using robotic arm technology with 3D modeling. We put two trackers here, two trackers here, so the computer is reading the position of the knee. There we go. Engage. If I turn the leg one direction or another, that robot knows where it's at based on the trackers. That's really good uh, registration there, 0.29. So we'll the computer is going to tell us how to balance the knee, make the knee stable, and how much bone to take. If I can't go to this part of the knee, the computer won't let me do that. If you go outside the line, it shuts itself off. Okay. All this is burred out to make a bed for this prosthesis. OK, posterior post. The future of orthopedics is robotics. Yeah. I can't believe they're going to get you up walking. That's like unbelievable. We'll see what kind of man he is. <laughs> Almost every That's knee real. replacement takes the ligaments. And so what we do for a partial knee is we keep the ligaments, the ACLs retained, Posterior cruciate is retained. Feel good to be off your back? Well, I was pretty comfortable. <laughs> Stand up. All right. You're up. You want to go for a walk? Sure. Yeah. 
good. People have the surgery to get moving again, to get them down on the floor playing with their grandchildren or going on fantastic vacations and hikes with their families. That's why I'm a physical therapist, to, to help people return to the things that they want to do most. You are looking great. We don't often see people up and walking on their first day, and we've seen more of that with the makeoplasty. How you doing? You doing all right? Good, man. Feel wow. better? I can already tell that there's good. a difference. When I put my foot down, the bite wasn't there. <laughs> I can't imagine my knee being any better. If somebody let me play in their band, I'd be there, man. Number 10, that was me. <laughs> I got all American. It's definitely hard to get used to just because I have defined myself as a soccer player. There's like mornings when I wake up where I'm really disappointed about my injury, but then I'll give myself like five minutes to grieve and have pity on myself. But then after that, you gotta do things today, you gotta get going. She was taking her cut to go in to score. I beat one of the players and then she was behind me. A defender on the other team came in from behind and tried to slide tackle me. Her feet flew out from underneath her and I like flew in the air and I was parallel to the ground. And I can still see her hitting the ground and bouncing. I just landed right on my back and that's pretty much all I remember. I keep waiting to wake up. This didn't really happen. She was growing up. I was letting go, and now, boom, all of a sudden, I want to be mom again. You know, I worried about her before, but now I really worry about her. It's just the little things, like get into the car, she can't feel if she's sitting on the ledge, so a few times she's missed and ended up on the floor. I just want to surround her with protection so that she's never hurt again. I ask her if she wants help, and she says no. I, let, I get mad if they try to do things for me that I know I can do. I say, I got it. I can do it. She was born with an opinion. And there it is. Oh. When I came back here, I learned about the hand controls and all the equipment that they use at Sharp for people with disabilities. I need hand controls. I want to drive. She's got to get back to school, you know? Pack up her car, pack up her dog, and get on the road back to Denver. Can you feel your legs at all? Uh -uh. Okay, so I'm gonna put this chest belt on you. My first day, I'd punch the gas too much, push the brake too hard, everybody's heads was going back and forth. But I always want you to steer first, yeah. brake second, and signal last. I am the president and owner of Better Life Mobility. This is where we do a lot of our adaptations uh, for anybody who requires some mobility equipment. As I push down, it's, it's, it's pushing down on the accelerator. As I push in, it's pushing the brake lever. I am a uh, Sharp Rehab graduate. I was a football player. I took a wrong hit. Going from a, a jock to a, a wheelchair user was difficult. I have a brake and a gas over here. I'm going to just have you steer around the parking lot. Keep I can't tell you the, the, the smile on their faces the first time they grab that steering wheel and they turn on that engine. Ready? Yep. Feel safe? Yep. That is the moment when you feel like, OK, it's my life again. Is anybody behind you? Nope. Where's your mom? Right over there. Honk if you love her. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a hard seven months for them. And the longer you're doing training, the more you know about them, the more you hear about what's going on in their life. Release the brake. I'm going to go forward. You can still hold on to it. I trust you. And once we get out onto the street, I'll let you have the accelerator and the brake with a new spinal cord injury. I'm very concerned that they know their physiological limitations. You don't sit for five hours without doing a pressure relief. Give it a little gas. Good job, Courtney. You've got the gas, the brake, and the steering. I'm getting my independence back. It's definitely making me feel like I'm completely normal and independent no. again. Now, usually we get a few oops, and you haven't made any mistakes today. It's not much different. Penny treats you like completely normal. It doesn't see the chair, she sees you. Bam. We did a high five, and I felt like it was part of her soccer team, you know? <laughs> the biggest thing that she struggles with is feeling 
that people only see the chair. She told me that I kind of been like that too, and, um, and so I'm working on it. We're gonna drive like the border of Utah and then make it to Denver tomorrow. Monday morning, I'm back to school. So you got everything out of your room? She's determined to do the things she wants to do and go the places she wants to go. Moving into a house with four other girls on my team. I'm going to be like an assistant coach this coming year. Go to all the games, all the practices. I still want to feel like I'm part of the team. Do you have any numbness or tingling? Absolutely. They stuck needles in it, and I, I couldn't feel a thing. He has severe spinal stenosis or compression of the nerves. He also has some major structural abnormalities in his spine. You can see there's actually a fracture through the bone. There's a psychological component to pain. It, it changes people's personalities. And I don't want to be one of those um, angry old men. This is the conduit through which the nerves travel, and the conduit is pinched down to nothing. I've had back pain for 35 years. And how would you describe your pain? It's like someone stuck a light socket at the end of your toe. It's that jolting. We'll have people come and say, I've had this pain for years. I'm done. I need help. I'm ready. And they reach out to us. They want change, they want their life back, they want to recover. We can't play golf together, we can't travel together. We actually like each other. We really do. He makes me laugh. How many years have you been married? Almost 37. 37. Congratulations. I, knew, see, I was going to say 37. Just, I, that, just that about that. I, I should have let him that. answer. <laughs> we'll be using a minimally invasive technique, transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion. He's going to put this medieval looking device along my spinal cord and then screw that into the vertebrae. It's, a, it's kind of an erector set going up. <laughs> we carry with us a deep respect for our patients. Really that, that comes to getting to know what kind of things are important to them. We'll be waiting for you. Looking forward to it so that Lee can get back to his life and we can enjoy each other. Got a lot of living to do. I will be using a minimally invasive retractor system. The minimally invasive retractor is great because we're able to make two smaller incisions on either side of the spine. Ready to rock and roll. That technique has really revolutionized the field because we're able to remove the compression on the nerves while leaving the paraspinous muscles untouched. We have the spine exposed. Because we're preserving the muscle, it generally enables us to mobilize the patients much earlier. This is the corridor through which we'll place the screws. Pedicle screws give bone time to heal and link the vertebrae together naturally. Schindelenberg, please. We've placed pedicle screws at L4, L5, and S1. Call from the OR. Thank you. OK, and when can I expect that to happen? When you know nothing about medicine, you sit here and wonder what's going on. Well, they've been great about calling. And so at this point, we're going to uh, remove the retractors and then close the incisions. You can have the best surgeon, but if you don't have the underlying kindness and caring for your patient, then the patients aren't going to have a good outcome. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I found several reasons for why he was in so much pain. He had a fracture through and through with complete uh, collapse of the disc and a little bone spur. One of those problems alone would cause a tremendous amount of pain. So I was able to fix all of it. So you're happy. The surgery couldn't have gone any better. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Oh, look. Dr. Ghosh is thrilled. Oh, he is so excited. I brought the chair kiss afterwards. This will make you happy too. Oh, that'll make me very happy. That's my posture. He looks actually very straight up here. There is no pain. Well, I take that back. There is a little pain. Yes, whatever you can do is good. This is pretty cool. Where is my little suitcase? You have one, babe? Yeah. And we're leaving tomorrow. A little surprise trip for our anniversary. He's always been full of surprises. Kind of a celebration trip. There is no pain, nothing. Absolutely nothing. We'll pack this up. I guess I guess I was in I was in so much pain that it was in my face. And my son said, you look different because the pain is now gone from your face. And we're going to be able to 
head on out of here in the morning. We have also planned uh, Thanksgiving. A and, Christmas cruise. And we hope to spend the next 20 or 30 years doing exactly the same thing. My husband would talk to me and say, you know, Joan, our daughter's on drugs. And I would say, no, not Jamie, you know, she may drink a little bit. I heard her being sick upstairs a lot. And so my first instinct was that she had an eating disorder. And he said, OK, just wait. We're either going to get a call from the coroner or a call from the police department. The issue about going to an upper middle class high school is there's a lot of money. There's a lot of drugs. I've always been a heavy drinker. I started out when I was about 15. We have the same tolerance. I thought it was so cool. I could drink any guy under the table. When I was 14, I started smoking weed every single day. Um, I was going to college parties. At 15, I was doing every drug I could get my hands on. I mean, I was stealing bottle handles of vodka after school, my freshman year of high school, and um, would drink every day after high school and blow lines, and then started dating the big drug dealer of our town, thinking that, you know, I was on top of the world. Like, I got this under control. I can get all the free drugs I want. He started to deal heroin. I started just smoking it, and then I was injecting it. The face of addiction now, it's, it's not the person you think, these are the children that are growing up in our suburbs. Parents are professionals in the community. When the cops brought her home and made her take off her jacket and show me her track marks, I just about fainted. You know, if you don't get your daughter help, she's only 17, she's going to die. I have seven days, and I'm on my eighth day. Seven days. This is my tenth The day. detoxification period varies depending on the substance used, the length of time the patient has been using. Seventeenth day clean. I have a week clean today, and my drug of choice was heroin. Joan came here first, and in her coming was very instrumental in her daughter coming to our program. I was slightly inebriated 24 hours a day. When my kids would come and show me their report cards, you know, Verbally, I'd say, great, good job. And inside, I'm just thinking, how many beers do I have in the refrigerator? You know, not your disease, and you're not the young lady that walked in here all scared. Jamie stayed here eight days, completed her detoxification. She's off to her 30-day residential treatment program. I'm so proud of her. I like this one. This is the rock. Jamie and all of our patients will leave with this stone. A reminder of the work that she's completed here. And we'll pass this around, put some love and encouragement in it. Jamie, this is for you. Put your wings on and, you. and go see the world. What happens here is they find people that are like them, that understand them. You and I, we're both young and we both got into the same bad stuff for the same bad reasons. And, and I'm just happy that we're both like on our steps to get out. The biggest thing is to find somebody that believes in you. That's the biggest hope that an addict can grab onto. It's been my pleasure um, to have you here. We are like at step zero, like getting the stuff out of our body. But I really hope that you can do this. I know I can. When I first saw you, you were gray and putrid looking. <laughs> now look at you, your laughter, your smile. It's about changing what I say to myself, what I hear in the quiet of my mind, and then how I process that into my beliefs. This is the longest I've ever been sober and been have, have clear thoughts since 13, 14 years old. With my mom as well, she came here and I saw her so happy here. And just thriving, and I wanted that so bad. We're both sober at the same time. Um, it's neat. Um, it's never really been like this, so it's going to be a new experience for us, and I think it's going to be a good one. Don't be afraid to be a parent. Don't be their friend. They have plenty of friends. It is this cherished stone I render in my hand to remind me I no longer live. Fill them up with hope, empowerment, and peace so they can start to hear the quietness in their soul. I will remember. When I turn and turn again, this most precious stone. Oh, thank you. The old theory used to be tough love. It sounds good. Let, let him hit rock bottom. An addict in their disease, bottom is death. This is better than tough love.
with uh, all brothers and me, it's, uh, we don't give it much sympathy. <laughs> she texted me saying I'm going into the hospital right now. I was screaming. I just can't even explain the pain. I did a whole bunch of x-rays and all sorts of stuff, and then it ended up being my kidney failing. Then when she was in the emergency room, I had worked all day, and then that's when Shane said, Dad, her kidney's messed up. This has been a problem that Bria's had her entire life, and over time it's been getting progressively worse. Bria's problem is right here where the ureter joins into the kidney, and her kidney function on the affected side is 20%. One of the options that she was originally given was just remove the kidney. And when we went and met with Dr. Anthony, he's the one who said it would, um, it would be better just to go ahead and try to repair it. I love you, too. I'll be there tonight. I love you. I love you, too. Bree is coming to us today so that we can robotically repair her kidney. I'm always in pain. <laughs> Hopefully the surgery will make it go away. So surgery day, I'm super nervous and freaking myself out. Hopefully today goes by fast. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna do a right robotic assisted laparoscopic dismembered pyloplasty. We're gonna go in and we're gonna disconnect your kidney where it's blocked and reconnect it and put everything back together. Yeah. I just wanna have it done, just trust the people that are doing it and then come out and be better. She'll be okay, we'll take good care of you, okay? Oh, yeah. We're more than just a lab coat with a name or scrubs with a badge. We're people, too, who understand that you're afraid, who understand this is a unique moment in your life, and that we're going to get through this together. You want to take real good care of you. Just try to relax. Nice, pleasant thoughts. We have the, uh, we have the kidney here. So when I look in, I have a 3D picture. The wrist movements move the entire uh, instrument. The finger movements open and close the instruments. This is a ureter here. And then this crossing vessel is what's caused her obstruction. So we're going to disconnect the ureter and reattach it over. Without the robot, the incision that she would have would probably be about here, as opposed to the um, eight millimeter port site scars. So we're spatulating it now. We're opening up the ureter to sew it back. Robotically, her post-operative advantages are she's going to have less pain. My expectation would be that she's going to be leaving the hospital probably on day one, day two, feeling back to normal, somewhere around the two-week mark. So everything's put back together. She's no longer obstructed. She's no longer blocked. Thank you, everyone. recently came in. She's doing great. She has no pain. She was she was texting. <laughs> I was looking at this little outfit I have in the bag that he was supposed to wear home and I'm just you know hoping that he gets to he was still breech and they ordered the C-section. I was really scared. A C-section is, is hard on the body. A woman bleeds a liter of blood, and she's you know, being wheeled to the recovery room. The only thing on her mind is, how is my baby doing? They're not concerned about themselves. They really aren't. How quickly can I get to see my baby? How quickly can I breastfeed? Right, that's all, that's, that's all that is on their mind. He's perfect. I found out she's going to have a C-section, the baby's going to be born, yada, yada, yada. The minute he came out, he was, he was mine. There's your mama. Got to feel him and kiss him, and you could already kind of see little bits of his personality. Aww. Sadly, well, from what I hear, his lungs are missed not developed as my parents want them to be. Immaturity of the lungs, respiratory distress syndrome. When you and I breathe, our chest goes out. With premature babies, their chest caves in because their lungs are stiffer than their chest wall. And then they came and said that they were going to have to take them to NICU. They didn't sleep last night because they kept kind of waking up panicky, like I felt, you know, like I should know where he was or feel him or something, and he wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hold it on 
When mom is touching baby, their heart rates will slow, their blood pressures will lower, all of their vital signs will improve. I just kind of talk to him like I would any of my other kids. I just tell him that he's doing a great job and trying to encourage him and tell him to slow down his breathing and that I love him and that we're here. I want to bring him home. He's got things attached to him everywhere, an umbilical arterial catheter, pulse oximeter, CPAP, which stands for continuous positive airway pressure to help keep the lungs inflated. The names they're going to pick out, Bailey, a dog name, Archer, and Donovan. I like Donovan. We just now decided it's Archer Donovan. It's texted out, it's on Facebook, it's official. <laughs> Why did you name him Archer? Because that's what we liked. We truly are an intensive care unit for the very small, the very sick babies. Yeah, should we wrap you up? Archer had to have a breathing tube placed and get two doses of surfactant, which is the chemical that helps keep your lungs open. He needed good nutrition through uh, IV fluids. He needed someone to help mom make sure that her milk supply came in. He needed uh, medications to help prevent infection. If there wasn't an NICU, he wouldn't have survived. Say hi, Daddy. Say we're going home. He's healthy and his color's great and his lungs are all clear. <laughs> he's just, he's wonderful. Coming home for time. Hello. I couldn't be happier having him home and I just, I feel blessed to have my family back together. Oh, oh he's smiling again. He loves being on daddy. This is life. This is changing people's lives. Every baby, every healing, every surgery, we take pride in every single one. Santa Catalina. What you doing, babe? Enjoying the sights and thinking about our next trip. And really, there's one overwhelming word in all of it, and, and that is love. It's, it's not only loving what you do, but loving who you're doing it for, who you're doing it with. Um, there's just a spirit of caring and kindness, and that's really what we're all about. I want to know what he's dreaming about. The Sharp experience begins when you choose an affiliated physician at 1-800-82-SHARP or sharp.com.